Our speaker this hour is Brother Doug McClish. He is going to be speaking on the subject of fornication and adultery. Certainly major problems in our society. He and his wife, Levon, have three children, seven grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. He was uh, thought that there should have been another category in last uh, in last lesson uh, of age discrimination because he feels like he's been discriminated against because of his age. Well, Doug, we can't help it that you were on the ark and uh, you know lived that long. So. Uh, we're trying to give you the due respect that uh, you deserve. <clears throat> he, uh, Levon, has not been doing well, and that's why uh, he is speaking at this hour and the uh, change in the in the schedule. Uh, she, one of her problems is macular degeneration in her eyes and she is in a test program and he has to get back in order to take her to uh, that doctor and have the, I think a shot in her eye and that's the way it goes and so uh, we were very happy to try to accommodate that situation so that he could return home. But, uh, we have a great deal of respect for Dub. He's a true scholar as far as God's Word is concerned. Uh, has done an extensive amount of writing and always does an excellent job with it. He works with the North Point Congregation now in Denton, Texas and preaches for them when he's not traveling. So know that he's going to do an excellent job in dealing with this subject of fornication and adultery. I appreciate uh, Brother Ken Chumley's uh, willingness to swap places with me so that I uh, could get home a little early. I regret that I have to get home early, and I regret the reason why I have to get home early. But, uh, you've heard of uh, people getting a poke in the eye. Levon's been getting those for 24 months now, once a month, in a study program, and uh, it has preserved a uh, condition. It hasn't improved it, but it's kept it from getting worse, and so we're thankful for that. And of course, I'm very thankful that I could be here, that you have uh, been gracious enough to invite me. I always count it a great privilege and honor to stand in this pulpit. I love your elders. I love your preacher and his wife. A lot's been said about Michael today, and I wouldn't take anything away from that, but uh, we really need to uh, pray for Karen, uh, maybe more than for Michael. <laughs> uh, ageism is a matter of uh, discrimination. Uh, you know, you might as well face it, uh, old folks are discriminated against. Uh, I don't buy green bananas anymore. Um, <laughs> Just think about it. <laughs> I went to the restaurant the other day. And they made me pay up front before I got my meal. So, <laughs> uh, ageism is a matter of discrimination. Well, so much for that. In the beginning, God created mankind, made them male and female commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God further inspired Moses to state his intent in this regard. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. Moses recorded the beginning of their fulfillment of God's first command to them, in simple and straightforward terms. And the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Genesis 4 and verse 1 and 25. That Adam knew Eve is a reference to their sexual union. 
the means by which they began the perpetual process of fruitfulness and multiplication of humankind that God had ordered. It is evident that God created us with sexual instinct and appetite and with the ability to fulfill it. It is no less evident that he intended us to fulfill it. In fact, Adam and Eve could not have obeyed God's command to reproduce and populate the earth apart from their acting upon this instinct and appetite. God made this instinct extremely strong, surpassed only perhaps by that of self-preservation involving the desire and need for food and drink. In his infinite wisdom, he knew that the sexual appetite must be regulated and controlled for it to be a blessing rather than a curse. God thus ordained the fulfillment of the sexual instinct, but only within his own clearly stated benevolent limitations. Not only is sexual fulfillment therefore not innately sinful, evil, or shameful, when engaged in, within God's limitation for it, it is guiltless, pure, and honorable. Well, having said that, what is the boundary of God's sexual fulfillment? Fornication and adultery describe the sexual activity outside the boundary God ordained for it. This boundary must therefore be included in any discussion of these terms. Were there no such limitation, there would be no violation, for where there is no law, neither is there transgression. Romans 4.15 God has issued a dictum on this matter, and as will become clear, those who ignore, reject, and disobey it become thereby guilty of fornication and or adultery and subject to the wrath of a holy and just God. The only sphere of innocent sexual intercourse involves three elements. One, it must be between a man and a woman. Genesis 1, 27, 28, from the beginning, that's stated and perpetuated throughout the inspired record. Two, it must be between a man and a woman who are married to each other. We can start with Genesis 1, 27, 28 again but it's particularly spelled out by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2. And three, the man and woman must be in a marriage that God authorizes. Matthew 19 and verse 6, what therefore God hath joined together. Jesus stated that these limitations were God's will in the first century, that they had been so from the beginning. He went all the way back to Genesis 2.24 and by implication that they would always be so. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Jesus employed fornication and adultery, those words, in the same context of Matthew 19. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And he that marrieth her when she is put away, committed adultery, verse 9. In a companion statement in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 32, Jesus had previously used these same two terms in discussing marriage and divorce. The two dozen or so loopholes that men have devised in an effort to evade New Testament teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage are largely traceable to attempts to justify relationships that involve fornication and or adultery. It's now time for us to explore the meaning of these terms. Our English word fornication derives from the Latin term fornix or fornicus, meaning an archway or a vaulted chamber. What in the world does that have to do with a sexual act, you might think? Well, such a building in ancient Rome was a venue for prostitutes and became a euphemism for whoredom or a brothel. Fornication in the King James and American Standard versions translates the Greek word pornea. This word and its four cognates appear 56 times in the New Testament, with pornea appearing 26 of those times. 
Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich defined pornea as, quote, prostitution, unchastity, fornication of every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse. Kittle defines pornea in the New Testament as, quote, all extramarital and unnatural intercourse. Thayer's definition of pornea is illicit sexual intercourse in general. Pornea is obviously a comprehensive term that embraces every sort of sexual union besides that which God has ordained within scriptural marriage, thus including sodomy, lesbianism, incest, bestiality, prostitution, adultery. Now the term adultery. In our English language, this uh, word traces back to the 14th century A.D., brought over from a Latin term, adulterare, meaning to corrupt. Adultery translates the Greek noun, marcaea, which Kittle defines simply as, quote, adultery or illicit intercourse. While Thayer defines marcaea as adultery, or he doesn't define a bolt adultery, but the cognate bird, Moikaio, as to have unlawful intercourse with another's wife. I think it's telling that Bauer, Art, and Genrich do not define any of this family of Greek terms except by the words adultery, adulterer, adulteress, commit adultery, and adulterous, omitting any description of that which constitutes adultery. Their omission of a definition of the term presumes that all English readers will be aware that these terms relate to physical sexual infidelity regarding one's spouse. W. E. Vine defines the noun, moikos, as denoting one who has unlawful intercourse with the spouse of another. I feel like I almost need to apologize for having used, <laughs> using these terms, but uh, we must use them in defining the terms and in seeing what the scriptures teach. The latter-day postulation that adultery refers only to breaking the covenant of marriage rather than to any sexual activity is merely a paltry, juvenile attempt to circumvent some of those plain, literal, and explicit doctrine of the Son of God. His inspired writers amend every word that he said, of course. In spite of this fact, some brethren, for example, the late John Edwards, Olin Hicks, Truman Scott, who for years taught at Sunset uh, International Bible Institute, and others, have touted and are continued to tout this demonic error. Such preposterous theorizing is born of sheer convenience and flies in the face of history and scholarship, both ancient and modern. Fornication, then, is a broad term that embraces every form of sexual prohibition and deviance, whether one is married or not, while adultery relates particularly to sexual congress of a married person with another person besides one's own spouse, thus representing a betrayal and corruption of one's marriage vows. While all adultery constitutes fornication, not all fornication is adultery. Fornication may relate to marriage, but adultery particularly does so. Both terms are also used sparingly in a metaphorical sense to describe unfaithfulness to Christ in the New Testament and the term adultery or whoredom in the Old Testament, the unfaithfulness of Israel to God. When Paul walked into Corinth in about A.D. 51, he entered a city that was known throughout the civilized world for its moral corruption. A hint of this turpitude is evident in his statement in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, and then about five other categories are listed. But those are the ones pertinent to this lesson. And such were some of you. This pagan metropolis was renowned for its temple of a goddess named Aphrodite. 
allegedly hosting a thousand or more temple prostitutes. From Paul's description, it was a center, it was also a center of sodomy as well. Even in an immoral, pagan world, Corinth was so distinguished for its debauchery and lewdness that men made a verb of its name. To Corinthianize meant to corrupt and debase. Our great nation has become Corinthianized, brethren, to a substantial degree over the past 50 years. To identify the principal source of this moral declension, we have to go back at least to the 19th century to an English naturalist by the name of Charles Darwin. His On the Origin of the Species in 1859 gave base men an excuse to deny the existence of a creator to whom they must someday give an account, including for their sexual behavior. Darwin's theories created a new religion whose devotees have prostrated themselves before a new trinity of nature, accident, and vast eons of time. They could now replicate the morals of animals, since after all that is all we are, merely advanced apes. The influence of evolutionary theory on sexual mores has been undeniably powerful and widespread especially in the Western world. Numerous and extensive factors coalesced in the 1960s, causing drastic changes in attitudes toward sexual behavior and producing a well-named sexual revolution. Perhaps we may profit from some of the history of that. What has produced it? What are those forces that coalesced? Let's go back into the 19, late 1940s and early 50s. Alfred Charles Kinsley. His influence can hardly be overemphasized. This Indiana University biologist, researcher, put quotes around researcher, at Indiana University, is credited with being the father of sexology, which means the study of human sexual behavior. His books on male and female sexual behavior 1948 and 1953, respectively, soared to the top of the bestseller lists. Only years later was it discovered that many of his statistics on sexual responses of little boys came from a serial pedophile whose identity Kinsey shielded, allowing the pedophile to continue his wicked and criminal activity. Kinsey derived his data from more than mere interviews, however. According to Wikipedia, Kinsey's sex research went beyond theory and interview to include observation and participation in sexual activity, including homosexual activity. With co-workers and with others, and with encouragement from him for his wife to become so involved with others, which she did. Kinsey filmed sexual acts which included co-workers in the attic of his home as part of his research. He did this to ensure the film's secrecy, which would have caused a scandal had it become public knowledge. Kinsey has been unmasked in recent years as not only a fraud in his research, but an obsessive pervert who hid behind an academic facade to live out his own sexual fantasies. Nevertheless, the influence of his books was major in moving sexual activity from the marital bed to anywhere with anyone, anytime. He gave our countrymen an excuse, if not actual encouragement, to experiment with quote-unquote guiltless sex as mere recreation. Perhaps more than any other one person, he prepared the way for the sexual revolution. He is still honored by Indiana University, by the way. They have a Kinsey Institute there, and he is held in great esteem. Decades before Kinsey's degeneracy, however, theological modernism and liberalism had been churning out faithless graduates from their sectarian seminaries. By the middle part of the century, post-World War II, the effects of these influences began to take a major pull, a toll on the moral fiber of a nation that, from its inception, had accepted the Bible as God's standard of moral behavior. More and more churchgoers heard their pastors from Sunday to Sunday cast doubt upon the Bible's inspiration and infallibility. 
It became less and less influential on national behavior in general and particularly on national morality. Every day of my public school years, up through 1953, we began the day with a homeroom devotional period where we had prayer and Bible reading. A 1962 Supreme Court ruling outlawed this practice. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, values neutral, as it was called, sexuality education, it's now called simply sex education, began finding its way into the public high schools the very next year, 1963. It taught the fundamentals of sexual performance, but allowed children to, teach, to, to reach their own conclusions about sexual parameters. The main concern of the curriculum was to instruct in safe sex, never mind morality. Even a dummy weighed down on the dummy scale can perceive that substituting classes on sexual performance for Bible reading and prayer is not going to encourage abstinence in teenagers. The tipping point of moral decline of our nation can undeniably be dated from the time of these events, and I suspect they were a prime cause of that decline as well. Millions of young post-World War II parents listened more to the radical leftist pediatrician Dr. Benjamin Spock and his anti-discipline, instant gratification advice for the rearing of children than they did to inspire wisdom. The pampered children of those indulgent and permissive parents reached their late teens in the mid-1960s. Many of these were ripe for the radical anti-establishment agenda of such hardcore rascals as Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, and our president's friend, Bill Ayers, in Chicago, with their slogans of, if it feels good, do it, or kill your parents. Such influences produced the maelstrom of radical anti-war riots on dozens of college campuses and cities, and produced the morals of a William Jefferson Clinton. All of these elements we've just described swam in a cesspool of sexual indulgence along with their radical politics. The general aim of these feckless punks was the fomenting of sufficient societal chaos and violence to overthrow former standards of civil democratic order, including moral standards that undergirded them. In this same time frame, Hugh Hefner introduced his Playboy philosophy and magazine paving the way for public tolerance, if not glorification, of pornography and its frequent offspring, fornication. While these civil and moral upheavals were occurring, social, theological, and political liberals were preaching their gospel of tolerance and non-judgmentalism regarding increasing sexual promiscuity. Predictably, the entertainment industry began to relax notably its former standards, such as they were, in the 1960s. Scenes, words, themes that formerly were not permitted on the big screen gradually began to appear, most of them involving sexual liberties. Lyrics in rock and roll songs, this is before the hard rock and the acid rock and the metal rock and all of the other rocks that came after the original rock and roll of the 50s. But lyrics in those rock and roll songs in the 60s picked up the same theme. Though they would seem mild compared with current ones, they were risque and shocking at the time. And During those years I called radio stations more than once and complained about the lyrics of songs they were playing. Television followed Hollywood's lead, with but few exceptions, its programming since the mid-1970s has been characterized by ever-increasing levels of indecency, much of it aimed at sexual titillation. The Internet has made pornography and even arranging rendezvous for fornicators available at the click of a mouse. The relaxing of heterosexual moral standards 
has given opportunity to sodomites and lesbians to make great headway in their campaign to earn general acceptance for their abominations. And the odious American Civil Liberties Union, seriously misnamed, has been a major force in defending the grossest forms of moral turpitude and in seeking to repress biblical influence on every hand. The sexual permissiveness of these and other factors have produced threaten, or that they have produced threatens to drown our nation in a flood of moral filth. America has been Corinthianized. Now, those things must have consequences, and indeed they have had and will continue to have. No one can fully predict all of the consequences this decline of decency will eventually yield. But it has the potential to bring our nation literally into bondage. But let's observe some of its effects. First, sex has been degraded, devalued, and dirtied. The Hebrews writer expressed the divine will when in chapter 13, verse 4, he wrote, Let marriage be had in honor among all, and the bed undefiled. This statement implies that to employ the bed, which is a word figure for the sexual union, outside of marriage defiles it. Ungodly and undisciplined folk have dragged it out of the marital bedroom, the sphere of God's honorable limitation for it. They have reduced sex to the level of barnyard and alley cat behavior, sometimes with apologies to those animals. And rather than its being the God-ordained, lovely, and pure relationship between one man and one woman who become flesh for life, to millions the sexual union has become casual recreation with no more shame, mystery, or privacy attached than playing a game of trivial pursuit or monopoly. The degradation of sex and the corresponding promotion of adultery and fornication have wrought extensive damage to God-ordained marriage, home, and family. The explosion of illicit sex has made it much easier, yea, has lent encouragement for spouses to stray from their marital vows. No-fault divorce laws that began appearing in the early 1960s mitigated the seriousness and shame of adultery. They made it convenient for husbands and wives to go their separate ways when they found that certain other one they just must have. It is now all but impossible to get a divorce in any state of our union on the grounds of adultery, a symptom of society's moral corruption. Although unstated on the court decrees, fornication, including adultery, is the cause of thousands of divorces every year in our nation. Non-marital and extramarital sexual encounters are of little concern to the masses. It has become commonplace for couples to live together as we euphemistically speak of it, openly, shamelessly in the eyes of most, sometimes for years, and producing children maybe later getting around to marriage, and maybe not even bothering. The widespread sin of fornication has spiked sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, to alarming levels. According to one website, one in five people in the United States has an STD, two-thirds of which occur in those 25 years or younger. One in four new STD infections occurs in teenagers. STDs are preventable. They're all but non-existent among those who remain chaste until marriage and those who are married and remain faithful to their wedding vows to and with one spouse. Can there be any doubt about the role the sexual revolution played in the shameful Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision in 1973? This made it open season on innocent life in the womb. Abortion is generally little more than a cruel and depraved means of birth control. It is the ultimate safety net for the affair and the one-night stand participants. 
were it not for the prevalence of adultery and fornication, the adultery or the abortion mills would go out of business overnight. Adultery and fornication have generated millions of murders since 1973. But what is the ultimate consequence of these sins? The earlier part of Hebrews 13, 4, we've noticed. Let marriage be had in honor among all, and let the bed be undefiled. But the remainder of the verse says, But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. This verse draws an unmistakable and undeniable line between the divinely ordained licit and the illicit fulfillment of the sexual appetite. It is licit and undefiled in marriages that God authorizes, Matthew 19.6 and Hebrews 13.4. The bed of such marriages is pure, just as clearly stated, however, the sexual bed in all other settings is illicit and defiled constituting fornication and or adultery. According to Thayer, the word judge in this verse is used specifically of the act of condemning and decreeing or inflicting penalty on one. Those who continue in these sins will receive God's just condemnation and penalty on the last day. Truth be told, there are few acts of which men are capable that more frequently fall under divine censure and prohibition in both testaments. The seventh commandment of Moses' law forbade adultery, and the tenth commandment forbade lusting after a neighbor's wife, Exodus twenty fourteen and 17. Elsewhere, the law forbade incest, homosexual acts, and bestiality with violators to be cut off from Israel. Leviticus 18, 6 through 23. The Lord and the New Testament writers continue this theme of condemnation of both fornication and adultery. Besides the Lord's injunctions concerning sexual misconduct in the gospel accounts, he further expressed his attitude toward fornication in his letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2, promising desire uh, uh, divine judgment and dire judgment upon the guilty if they did not repent. He even struck at the source of these sins, the lustful eye and heart, Matthew 5, 28 and 15, 9. Paul refers to these sins more than any other New Testament writer. Fornication found its way into the Corinthian church. That's an irony. The Corinthian church was Corinthianized. Paul ordered the brethren to have no company with the fornicator in their midst, lest the entire church be Corinthianized. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 through 11. And of the ten sinful behaviors Paul listed that were, will bar one from the heavenly kingdom, half of them were sexual sins. Now I know idolatry is one of those five I've listed, but you could not separate idolatry from sexual sins in the city of Corinth. That's in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Paul has an even longer list that includes these sins in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Later in the same context of 1 Corinthians 6, he labeled fornication as a sin from which the Christian must flee. He then continued the great chapter on marriage in chapter 7 by urging the beginning of the chapter, that each man and each woman should have his own spouse in order to avoid fornication. He wrote numerous other warnings about and condemnations of these sins, which we've listed in the book. A great voice out of the throne on high informed John that fornicators, among other reprobates, shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21, 3 through 8. That same great voice further told him that fornicators, along with assorted other impenitent sinners, would be shut outside the heavenly city. Revelation 22, 14, 15. Adulterers will suffer the same fate, though they are not listed separately from the fornicators in these two passages, but remember fornication embraces the sin of adultery. Unmistakably, the ultimate consequence of fornication and adultery, if unrepented of, is eternal hell, the lake of fire, the second death, being shut outside the splendor, glory, and joy of heaven. 
We live in an exceedingly wicked world, saturated with encouragement on every hand to fulfill one's sexual desires in ways and in settings that a righteous God cannot tolerate indefinitely. The destructive influence these constant stimuli have had and continue to have on young people is a special source of concern to all who value moral purity. But what can we do about it? Well, Paul and his first century companions in the gospel faced a sex-saturated world, as has been evident from various passages already today. Though admittedly it was without the instant accessibility that we have in modern technology. However, the way they responded to these corrupting influences was to preach the word in season and out of season by every means at their disposal. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. The gospel that was the power of God into salvation in the first century is the power of God into salvation in the 21st century, Romans 1.16. The more we preach it, the more potential impact we may have as a purifying influence in a putrid world. But we must not only preach it, brethren, we must live it. And we must encourage and exhort our brethren to live it. We can vote for candidates at every level of politics who we know stand for moral decency that they will stand. Challenge them by letters and by phone calls and by every means we have of communicating with them. Show up at their town meetings and express the grave concern over moral decadence. Many people still read letters to editors of local newspapers in which we can voice the need for moral purity. And then let us continue to pray for our families that our children and grandchildren may remain pure while doing our best to provide biblical moral guidance and instruction for them. Let us pray for the church, so many members of which have succumbed to the siren songs of adultery and fornication. Let us pray that men and women in positions of authority may be awakened to the reality of the moral pig pen in which our nation now wallows, and that they may exert leadership in reversing it. Let us pray, God, that in his providence we may withstand the tsunami of sexual immorality that has struck our shores and undo the great damage it has done the past 50 years. Brethren, if we are not able to do so, given the inspired history of God's dealing with nations and their wickedness, I'm made to wonder how much more long-suffering God will have for our nation. Thank you.